All right, today we're going to discuss chapter 7.5, Systems of Inequalities. What we're dealing with in this section are not equations with equal signs, but inequalities with inequal signs, if you would, things like this. It says the statements 3x plus 2y less than 6 and 2x squared plus 3y squared greater than or equal to 6 are inequalities... Uh, there is a space that it shouldn't be there right there, but they are inequalities in two variables. An ordered pair or a point, that's what ordered pair means, um, a, b, or x, y, is a solution to an inequality if the inequality is true when a and b are substituted in for x and y. All right, so if you put a point in for x and y, and the inequality statement is true, then that point x, y is obviously a solution. Not a groundbreaking concept there. It works. Um, you've, you've been familiar with this before. So the graph of an inequality is a collection of all solutions of the inequality. This is where things are going to differ a little bit from what you know already from equations. Um, our answers to inequality statements are actually a range of infinite values not a single point or a collection of a couple of finite points. I'm using a lot of math terminology here, but let's jump into some of the uh, examples. You'll know what I mean. It says, first, sketch, ske to sketch the graph of an inequality in two variables, you do two things. One, replace the inequality sign with an equal sign. So imagine it was an equal sign in there instead of an inequality sign, right? Um, and then sketch the graph of the resulting equation. Now, be careful, though, because if, if um, your symbol is greater than or less than, I should say less than or greater than, then you're going to use a dashed line or dashed curve instead of a solid curve. If your inequality symbol or statement is greater, less than or equal to or greater than or equal to, less than or equal to here, greater than or equal to here, then you will use a solid line. All right, so we got to remember that point, and I just realized that there is a parentheses missing on this. There we go. Um, so once you've uh, once you've got it sketched, then you test a point in one of the regions that is left, and if that point works, if it satisfies the inequality statement, then you're going to shade the region that that point lies in. If that point does not work, then you're going to shade the region that 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 point um, does not lie in. Um, the opposite region. So once you've got it graphed and you were careful to use either a, a dotted line or a solid line, a dashed line or a solid line, then you test the point. Usually I'll tell you that the point that we test, usually our test point is going to be the origin, zero, zero. All right. So with those rules in hand, let's jump into it. First problem says sketch x is greater than negative two. So if x is greater than, notice that the inequality is not uh, with an equal sign underneath of it. So since it is not equal, we're going to use a dashed line or dotted line, if you would. All right, so x is greater than negative 2 is a vertical line at negative 2. So we're going to use a dashed vertical line. All right. And then if we were to test a point, let's say we test 0, 0 here. Well, 0, 0 is 0 for x is greater than negative 2. So we're going to shade the region that includes that value. I'm going to use a larger shading here so that this gets done quicker. All right, so again, since zero is greater than negative two, we're shading the side that includes that. Another way to think about it is um, if we're looking at this vertical line, it is dotted again because it's not equal to, but if we're looking at this vertical line, we want all x's that are bigger than where that line sits. So all the x's that are bigger are these x's. All the x's that are smaller are the ones on the left here. All right, moving on, number three, or number two y is less than or equal to, we have an equal, 
And so therefore, we're going to use a solid line. All right. Y is less than or equal to 3, so we're going to draw a solid line up here at 3. And then if we test the point 0, 0, that point is um, less than 3. And so we're going to shade the region that includes that point. Again, another way to think about this is to say um, we want all the Y's that are less than 3. And certainly, everything below this line gives you y values less than 3. All right? Again, you probably remember this. This is one of, the, one of the more interesting things that you do in an Algebra 2 class or maybe even Algebra 1 because you get to play with colored pencils. You get to do a little bit of artwork with it. All right. Stepping it up a notch, we did a vertical line in number 1. We did a horizontal line in number 2. Let's talk about number 3. In number 3... Um, there is a tendency for students to look at a problem like this and go, oh, well, I should solve for y. Well, you can if you want to, but you don't have to, right? You can graph this problem just using a table of values and finding your x and y intercepts. I like to call it this, you know, little t-chart. Let x be 0, let y be 0. If x is 0, then you have negative y. Uh, again, we're going to replace, if you go back to step one up here, it says replace the inequality symbol with an equal sign. So we're imagining that this inequality down here is an equal instead of uh, in inequality. Um, but if I cover up the x, right, if this x is gone, I'll cover it up with my dot here. If the x is gone, then I have negative y equals, I'm sorry, is, yeah, equals 2, which means y must equal negative 2, right? So if x is 0, y is negative 2, well, that gives me the point 0, negative 2 on the graph. And if I cover up the y, cover up the y here, then x is equal to 2. So when y is 0, x is 2. Again, I'm covering it because I'm saying it's equal to 0. So if y is 0, it's gone, and I'm left with x is equal to 2. All right, so 0, 2 is my other point. I'm sorry, 2, 0, 2, 0. Then it is a, da uh, a dashed line because of our inequality. Um, so I'll draw my dashed line. And then we test a point. Well, what happens if I test the point 0, 0 in the inequality? If both x and y are 0, then I get 0 minus 0 is less than 2. Well, that is true. 0, 0 is less than 2, which means the point... 0 minus 0 is less than 2. So which means the point 0, 0 is in my solution set. And if it's in the solution set, then that's the area that I'm going to graph. I'm going to shade, I should say. So here we go with the shading on the upper side here. Now that is one way to do it. I think it's an easy enough way. If you are uh, the type of person who absolutely goes, no, 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 I want to solve for y. I like it in y equals mx plus b form. That's fine. Solve it in y equals mx plus b form, right? You would go uh, probably negative y is less than negative x plus 2, and then you would probably rewrite that as y is greater than, be careful because it changes the inequality, positive x minus 2, right? And then this is what you're graphing. Um, the y is greater than x minus 2. Well, if that's what you graph, notice... Um, the line does have a y-intercept of negative 2, right? And it does have a slope of 1, up 1 over 1, up 1 over 1. My line's not perfect, but up 1 over 1, up 1 over 1, up 1 over 1, slope of 1, y-intercept of negative 2. And then the inequality symbol, greater, tells you that you're going to graph everything greater than that y-value. So if this is the line, that's our boundary line, and everything greater than that for y. So y is above, and it tells you to shade the stop, this, this area. And the test point stuff is not necessarily um, mandatory here. All right? So uh, the next problem is already solved for y. Um, so if I say x squared minus 1, we should all know how to graph that. That's just a quadratic function. x squared shifted one unit down. Notice that my inequality symbol is, in fact, solid. 
So I'm going to draw a solid line, x squared minus 1 is just the graph of x squared shifted one unit down, and that gives me this function. All right, and then the question is, where do I shade? Well, test a point. If I test at the point 0, 0, then 0 is greater than or equal to 0 squared minus 1, which means 0 is greater than or equal to negative 1, and that is true. So we're going to shade the area that includes the 0, 0 point, and that is the area inside our parabola inside this quadratic function. All right. There you have it. A um, little uh, note down here at the bottom. S many practical problems of business, science, engineering, economics, we're going to discover at the end of this lesson, um, involve systems of linear inequalities. A solution to a system, these were not systems, by the way, these were just straight up inequality statements. There were no systems because we weren't grouping together two or more inequality statements. Um, but a system, which we're going to see on the next page, of inequalities in x and y has a solution um, x, y that, that will satisfy both statements or all statements at the same time. So let me say that again. The solution to a system of inequalities is the collection of all points that solve all of the inequalities at the same time. All right? So sketch the graph of a system of linear inequalities. We first sketch each individual inequality, and then we find the region that is common. Um, find the region that is common to every graph. All right? And we're going to shade just that region. I'll show you what I mean here. In this first example, I'll tell you what. Let's go ahead and... Uh, and rewrite this the way that most of you would prefer it was written. That means solve for y. All right. Um, this first statement is going to be y is greater than x minus 2. Why is that? Because I am taking this first inequality statement and maybe uh, um, my first step would be negative y is less than negative x plus 2. And then as I move that negative over, or I divide by the negative, however you want to say it, um, these are going to change signs. But also, my inequality will change directions. So you got to be careful about that, right? Whenever you divide by a negative, the inequality symbol switches. We remember that from algebra. All right, then um, the other statements, I'm not messing with those. x is greater than negative 2. y is less than or equal to 3. All right, so if I graph these, x is greater than negative 2, y is less than or equal to 3, by the way, are the same graphs we drew in the first and second example. If I go back up, and then the third one, um, I'm sorry, the first equation is the same graph as the first example, or as the third example. So we're really just re-graphing 1, 2, and 3. All right, same three inequalities are here. All right, anyway, let's uh, start with the first one, this y. So we're going to go down 2. And slope of 1, and it's going to be a dotted line. All right. And then I'm going to say, okay, well, this greater than means I should, I should uh, graph above the line. Above the line. So I'm going to just draw these little mini arrows here. If I were doing this without color um, and just a pencil, this would be even more important than I just draw these little mini arrows. We, I don't prefer, I don't like to have all the shading going on all over the place. I would much rather just have um, a couple of arrows telling me which, which side I'm going to shade and then, and then leave it at that. Um, for the second line, I will have uh, x less than negative 2. I'm sorry, x greater than negative 2. So negative 2 is going to be down here. I'm doing it dotted because all right, this is the x equals negative 2 line. This was the y equals x minus 2 line. And then finally, I have y is less than or equal to 3. Oh, I just did that wrong. Let me back up. This should be a vertical line. Sorry about that. 
Let me fix it. X greater than or equal to negative 2 is going to be here. That's a vertical line. My mistake. And then I need my horizontal line um, at 3. And this one actually is solid because it's Y less than or equal to. All right. For the um, horizontal line, it was greater than the X value greater than. So I'm going to shade to the right. So now you can see I'm kind of confined into this triangle, it looks like. All right. And then for the purple, for the third one here, um, we've got the purple line, we've got the green line, and then technically I have the blue line here. Um, for the purple one, I am shading below because of the less than or equal to here. So if I shade below that line, that leaves me definitely inside of this triangle. Um, and that means the area that I want is here. Any point in this region, this is the key, any point in this region will solve this system of equations. So if I choose any point, let's go, it doesn't have to be a specific point on a uh, coordinate, but let's go uh, 1, 1. This point here I just showed here in red. If I were to take this point 1, 1 and plug it in all three of these inequalities, or all three of the original, it would make all three of them true at the same time. If x is 1, y is 1. 1 minus 1 is 0, that's, that's definitely less than 2. 1 is definitely greater than negative 2. 1 is definitely less than 3. It solves them. It doesn't have to be a point at, you know, like the intersection of integer values. It could be anywhere. I could put a point right there. It could be random decimal values or fractions, right? Anywhere in that shaded region. More so, what we are going to be interested in for application purposes is the, are, are the points at the vertices. In other words, the points where the shaded region, um, the boundaries of the shaded region intersect. So if I were to call these points... Um, let's say point A here, point B here, and point C here, those three points are going to be really important for us to find and focus on when we're doing applications. Point A is very clearly at, um, looks like negative 2, negative 4. Point B is up there at negative 2, positive 3. And point C is over at 5, 3. Again, highly, highly critical, those values. You've got to be able to find those intersections. Whether you're finding it by hand or you're finding it on a calculator, um, either way, uh, you need to be able to find those values. I might, I might have to show some of those uh, calculator examples in class. All right, number two. Like the last one, I'm going to start this problem by uh, rewriting the statement in, um, in a form that most people would prefer for graphing. All right, so in other words, I'm going to solve for y. I'm going to solve both of them for y. So if I take this inequality and I isolate the y, bear with me here, um, I get y is greater than or equal to uh, positive x squared minus 1. And why is that? Because the step in between, which I'm not showing, would have negative y is less than or equal to negative x plus 1. And then when I move the negative over, the inequality sign changes, changes from less than to greater than. And the x goes negative, the 1 goes negative. I'm sorry, the, the x goes positive and the 1 goes negative. All right. And if I do the same thing with the second equation, this time I don't have to deal with any negative. I can just move the x's over. All right, and it just becomes plus x. Okay? Um, so for this one, if I graph each inequality individually, notice they're both going to have solid lines. So let's do, uh, let's do the top one in purple color, and we'll do the bottom one in... A blue color. Oh, that blue doesn't really show up very well, does it? Let's go with the bottom one in a red color. 
Hopefully that's visible. Um, so if I do the top one in purple, it's x squared shifted one unit down. So it, we graphed this one earlier. Oops, I was supposed to do that with a purple. Shifted one unit down. Um, when x is 2, I'm going to be at 3. And when x is negative 2, I'm going to be at 3. So I've got this parabola. All right. Um, and if I look at the inequality sign, it's greater than, which means I should be graphing above that y coordinate that I have already shown. You can probably hear my dog whining in the background here. Um, we're going to grade. A, we're going to shade above, so it's going to be inside that per, that parabola. But if I graph the second line here, that's x plus one, which is a y-intercept at one and a slope of one. You can see how they intersect at these key values. I can keep going here, and that is. I'm sorry, I drew that wrong. God, that's the second mistake here. That's supposed to be a less than symbol. I wrote that in, I wrote that incorrectly. Um, if you look here, this was less than, and there was no negative in front of the y, so it should stay less than. Sorry about that. If you are following along, you've probably gone, oh, he's made two mistakes now, and you would be right. I did. Sorry. All right, so... <laughs> Um, if I'm graphing that line less than, then it's below, which means I am confined to this little space inside. This is my shaded region. Okay. So any point inside that shaded region makes this inequality uh, system of inequalities true. And we can also see, thankfully, that there are two points of intersection um, there's a point of intersection here, a vertice, and there's a vertice here. And these two vertices are, again, critical when we're trying to solve a system uh, as it pertains to an application. In other words, if we were doing some sort of word problem or apply problem here. All right. Sometimes those points are really tough to find. A calculator is helpful in many cases. Desmos can help you, um, desmos.com. But the truth is, um, you can also find them by just literally solving the system. If I set the two statements equal to each other, if I take the um, x squared minus 1, whoops, and set it equal to x plus 1, right? They are equal at the points where they intersect. So if I set them equal and solve, I get an inequality, or I get an equation, x squared minus x minus 2 equals 0. And that factors into x, my, uh, x plus 1, x minus 2, which means at x equal negative 1 and x equals positive 2, I get um, uh, intersection points. Well, that's in fact true. At x equals negative 1 right here. We're intersecting. At x equals positive 2, we're intersecting. Now, we don't know the y values, but you could find those just by plugging into the statements. If I plug negative 1 into either of these statements, probably easier to plug it in here. If I plug negative 1 in here, I get 0. So negative 1, 0 is a point of intersection. If I plug 2 into this, I get 3. So 2, 3 is the other point of intersection. Now, again, we found those points on the graph. We already had it here and here when we graphed the 2. But that's because this one worked out neatly. Some of them don't work out so nicely, and you actually have to solve uh, algebraically like this by setting the two inequality statements equal. All right, let's move on. Number three, this gets the graph of the system um, of the solution set. Again, the solution set is the graph. There's no other way to express this, really. So in this problem, if I rewrite both inequalities so that they are solved for y, I get y is greater than negative x plus 3, and y is less than negative x um, minus 1. So if I graph the first one, negative x plus 3, I'm going to go up 3, and then I have a slope of negative 1, so down 1 over 1, down 1 over 1. It's got to be a dotted line because this is um, less than, not an equal. There's no equal sign there. 
so dotted. And greater than means I would shade above the line on this side of it. All right, then I graph the um, second line here, and I get y is less than or y is equal to, if you want to replace the inequality with an equal sign, negative x minus 1. So minus 1 is down here, and the slope again is negative 1. So these two lines are parallel. That was clear. They had the same slopes here. Um, slope of negative 1, negative 1. And if I graph them, they're both dotted lines running next or running parallel to each other. And the, the tricky part here, though, is that the orange line that I've drawn, which is the second line, it's asking us to shade below because of the, the less than sign. So if I'm shading below, then the two shaded areas don't intersect. If you have no overlapping of the shaded areas, then there is no solution to the system. There are infinite points. All the points in this region here would solve this inequality, the second inequality. All the points in this region here would solve the top inequality. But there is no point that solves both inequalities at the same time. So there's no solution to the system. All right, moving on. Sketch the graph of the set. Again, we're going to start with rewriting our inequality statement so that it's solved for y. We find that to be a lot easier when graphing. Um, this one, we, we technically got two steps. All right, as you bring it over, you've got 2y is greater than negative x plus 3. And so when you divide by 2, y is greater than negative 2 thirds x plus 3 halves. All right, and I'm sorry, not negative 2 thirds, negative 1, negative 1 half. Man, I'm messing up all over the place today. Negative 1 half x plus 3 halves. Um, so we've got, a, we've got some fractions. That's okay. Don't be scared of it. No big deal. We can graph this. Um, y is less than negative x plus 3. Simple line. We've got a y-intercept up here at 3. We have a, uh, a negative 1 slope. So we go down 1 over 1. It's going to be dotted because of the lack of equal sign on the inequality. All right. And then because it's less than, I'm shading below the line. So I'd be shading on that side. Tell you what, I'm going to take the second line and change the color. Let's go with the bright red here. If I graph this line, this is where you might have some trouble. It is just a fraction. It's not a big deal. Three halves. Three halves here. My y-intercept is one and a half. So I'm going up one and a half. And then my slope is negative one half. So I'll go down one over two, down one up, oh, sorry, down one over two, down one over two, right? Again, from here down to one pick takes me there, and over two would put me here. So if I put that point in, let me just let me just place it. It's gonna go right about where I put that arrow, unfortunately. Delete the arrow. And then if I go down one and over two again, it puts me there. If I go, want to go the other way, I could go up one and backwards, right? Up one and backwards two would put me here. Up one and backwards two would put me here. And I keep going, right? This is also a dotted line. No equal sign on it. All right. So that's the red line. And then this is a greater than symbol, which means I'd be graphing everything above or greater than that y value, which puts me inside this little crevice here. So it looks like my shaded region is here based on the shading of both lines. Shows maybe a uh, highlighter that was a little too thin, <laughs> but you get the point. There we go. So any point that I choose inside that shaded region would make this inequality statement true. This question is asking for the points of intersection. That's not quite as easy as it looks. 
we should verify. It does kind of look like it's at 3.0 here, all right? Or maybe it goes a little bit below. But my graph is just an estimate. Maybe if I had a ruler or something, I could draw this a little bit more accurate. My graph is not perfect, particularly because that one and a half was estimated, all right? So be careful. This is one of those problems where you absolutely should be careful to not just look at the graph and say, oh, well, it looks like it's at, uh, I don't know, just a little more than three, or maybe you are calling it three zero. Actually solve, test and see what happens when I put these two equations equal to each other. Negative x plus three. Actually, I tell you what, I'm gonna use the same color that I had. Negative x plus three equal to negative one half x plus three halves. You set them equal and you solve. All right, if I set them equal to each other and I try to solve this, um, let's see, I'm gonna, I'm gonna subtract three halves. So three minus three halves leaves me with three halves over here. If I subtract one from, no, if I add one to one and a half, or to one half, I get one half x. And then if I multiply both sides by two, I get three. Aha, uh -huh. it looks like x is three. And if x is three, look here, if I put three in for x, it doesn't matter which equation you put it in because you're, you're saying that this is the point where the two intersect, which means, which means they share that value, right? They both have the same x value. So if x is three, then y must be zero. That's our point of intersection. So it, it looked like it could have been three zero over here on the graph and it was in fact three zero where they intersected. And that's the only point of intersection here because it's just two lines. All right, moving on. Write a system, a different kind of question here. Write the system. So here we're just, we're just trying to come up with the equations for the lines that shade the region given. All right. Um, so let's go with the diagonal line first. All right, this line um, here. It looks like it has, I'm gonna go ahead and assume, just for the sake of simplicity, that this y-intercept is up here at two. All right, the y-intercept at about two, or maybe, maybe not. Maybe, um, maybe we call it, maybe we call it two and a half, two and a half. All right, this point here looks to be at about five halves, two and a half. So I've got y, it's shading below below this line, so it's gonna be an inequality of less than, equal to, it's solid, right? And then my slope, um, let's see, if I go down from here, if I go down one, one, two, three, and over two, and we're estimating here, it's not perfect. It looks like if I go down three and over two, I get to another point on the graph. Again, it's all estimates. It's kind of hard to see if you zoom in enough. Maybe maybe that's what I should do is zoom in. All right. It does look like this is at a half or, or two and a half, I should say. And it does look like maybe we could call this one just one half below. All right. Again, we might be flubbing this math, and estimating this a little bit too much. But if I go down three and over, is that down three? Hmm. What if I went, I'm sorry, I'm thinking out loud here. What if I went one, two, three, four, five, all the way down, and then went over one, two, three. Maybe I should assume that point instead. Let's do that. Let's make that easier. Let's, uh, let's assume that this point here is right at the corner, or right where uh, x equals three. All right, so I'm going to call the slope negative five-thirds. Again, it's an estimate, it's not perfect. I would hope that if you had a problem like this on my math lab, you could, uh, uh, or a test or something, you could read that point a little bit more clearly than this notes shows. But anyway, I'm gonna say that the, that the y-intercept is two and a half or five halves and that the slope is down five over three, negative five thirds. All right, let's move on. Um, the second line, let's go with the horizontal line here. Um, this horizontal line looks to be clearly, I think, at negative two and a half. So if I go y is greater than or equal to negative five halves, which is negative two and a half, 
And then let's say the third line is, we'll go with a blue here. And that's vertical, so it's x is greater than or equal to, and that's definitely negative 2. Greater than because we're shading to the right. All right, so there we have it. Um, we're shading below this line, below. We're shading above this line, up here. And we're shading to the right of this line over here. So it gives us that region. Okay, last page here, last group, is a discussion on applications. Supply and demand in particular. Now, I will admit straight up, I'm not a big fan of the way that this, this uh, paragraph uh, lays out um, the concept here. It's kind of, it's, it's, it's just poorly written, this paragraph. Um, it says supply and demand curves describe how the number of units uh, of a particular good, so a number of units of some commodity or some ob object uh, that, a w that a market is willing to produce um, or consume, is related to the price of the object. Again, if you read that, you read it multiple times. I've read it multiple times. I've taught this same lesson multiple times. I have never liked the way this paragraph reads, but um, I haven't uh, haven't taken the notes and, and changed it. Um, the key here is that we want to talk about um, two different functions: the supply function and the demand function. All right. If you just I'll just describe it. This might be kind of hard and, and difficult in words, but the fact is, if a company is making a commodity. Let's say uh, let's say Apple is making iPhones, and um, everybody let's say we're 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 five six years ago, and everybody is still all gung ho about about iPhones, and every everybody wants an iPhone, and and uh, the other stuff like Galaxy are just struggling to uh, get their foot in the market. Um, then the fact is, uh, the 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 more the demand for that phone, the higher they can set the price, all right? Um, so if the demand is really high, they can, they can uh, uh, raise the price. Or let me, let me do it, let me compare it this way. What if we had limited quantity? Because that's what our, our graph is talking about, price versus quantity, all right? The demand is what we like to call the price to the consumer. This is the consumer's price. This is what you as a buyer or me as a buyer would pay. All right? So if the quantity was really high, let's say they overproduced the iPhone and then all of a sudden nobody, everybody already had one, but they still had a bunch of phones out there they wanted to sell. Well, then the price would go down. Price is on the right, the, the, the y-axis here. The quantity was high. If we were over farther on the right right side of the x-axis, price would decrease because they have too much quantity. They want to move product. All right. If price was, I'm sorry, if quantity was low, then they would set the demand the price high because the demand for that product would be higher. People would go out. This happens every Christmas. Everybody wants to buy the newest PlayStation console. Well, guess what? Everybody's buying a PlayStation console, and there aren't a whole lot of them in the market, and so they're going to raise the price. All right. Um, you also see this in crises like what we're dealing with right now. People are raising prices on masks um, during this, this COVID-19 crisis um, because they don't have a whole lot of them. So it keeps the market from running out entirely. They raise the price and people go, you know what? Maybe I don't need it. Maybe I'm going to leave it on the shelf for now and wait till that price comes down. All right. So the, the demand is usually a decreasing curve. All right. Then we talk about the supply curve. This is the actual um, production of an object. The more objects you want to produce, the more, more you want to put in supply, the more it's going to cost you, right? You're going to have to pay more to produce more. The supply curve is generally not always a, a line, but it is often an increasing function, at least for, um, for the beginning of a curve. And then it starts to decrease or flatten out at some point. But for now, we're going to say the supply curve is an increasing curve. The demand curve is a decreasing curve. And hopefully with that little explanation I just gave, you get some sort of idea about what we're talking about here. Um, notice again, x-axis is the quantity, the amount of the object in production. And 
the price of the object is on the y-axis. Now here's the thing. The equilibrium point where, um, or you could call it break-even point, where the demand of the object meets the supply, that is called, again, equilibrium or the break-even break -even point. Manufacturer produced exactly the amount they needed. They set the price, and they're breaking even on their quantity. All right. Um, let's, uh, let's move on. I'll talk more about this. Let's move on to the example. The example says the demand of a supply function, the demand and supply function, sorry, for a new type of personal digital assistant, <laughs> it, tells you, it tells you how dated um, this problem is. They're talking about PDAs. Now our PDAs. They used to be an individual little, uh, they used to call them Blackberries. Um, our PDAs used to be uh, uh, handheld devices that had no re real internet connection like our phones do. Now our phones are our PDAs, our phones, our game system, and all this other stuff all, all in one, right? Um, but anyway, PDA used to be just basically a, um, uh, a calendar in your pocket, electronic calendar in your pocket. You could schedule stuff on it, and you could keep, you know, records of and notes and, and things like that, uh, phone numbers, and, and you could take notes on it. But that was about it. It wasn't connected to the internet most of the time. All right. Anyway, they're connect. They're they're producing PDAs, and we've got a demand curve and a a supply curve. Now remember, if you're going back to the explanation I just gave, the demand curve is the one with the negative slope. So that has to be this one, right? The demand is going down. This has a negative slope. All right. So. I'm going to call this the demand function. Again, that's the price that the consumer pays. Oops. The price that the consumer pays. Um, and then the second one here would be the supply function. All right. Usually they use um, the letter rho here instead of P, but that's okay. Um, the problem one says the supply and demand curves intersect at the equilibrium point. I've already made that statement. Find the equilibrium point for the supply and demand curves. Okay, well, no big deal. We just set the two equal to each other, right? I'm going to take my 150 minus 0.00001x, be careful the amount of zeros there, and set it equal to the supply curve, which was 60 plus 0.00002x. Alrighty then. So if I solve this thing, um, I'm going to piece together, subtract 60 and add 0 0.00001 to the other side. So I get 90, 90 equals 0 0.00003x because I'm adding that um, 0 0.00001x to the other side. Now if I divide by 0 0.00003, 90 divided by 0 0.00003 is 3 million. So they need to produce 3 million personal digital assistants, 3 million PDAs to break even. The question is, what would the price be? Well, we take that 3 million number and we plug it back in to either of our statements, either one of these. All right, so if I plug it into the second one, um, I'm going to go with green for, for price. The price that they set is 60 plus 0 0.00002, four zeros, times the 3 million number. And solve that, and you're going to get 120. So they set the PDAs at a cost of $120 a piece. If they sell them at $120 a piece then, and they make $3 million of them, then they'll break even. All right? They make too many, then the market's going to be saturated. It's going to cost them too much, and they won't be able to sell them at the price they want. They make just under that, and they'll be able to raise the price and make some money. All right? So let's move on with this concept. Question two says... The supplier surplus, 
I'm sorry, the consumer surplus, not supplier surplus. The consumer surplus is, let me go to the highlighter here, consumer surplus is defined as the region, that's a shaded region, that lies below the demand curve and above the horizontal line that passes through the equilibrium point. So in other words, on the graph, the consumer surplus is this region here. This is a concept that uh, many economics classes will discuss, most economics classes will discuss with you, um, and uh, is, a, is a pretty fascinating discussion because it talks about really savings to you and I, the consumer, the people who buy the product, right? Um, it's the area of that region. Now, what does that area represent? We're moving up, we're actually moving into a little bit of a calculus uh, concept here, but we don't have to use calculus because to find that area, all we need is some geometry. It's just a triangle, right? That area I just shaded is just the area of a triangle. So we can find that area using some geometry. But if those those were not lines, if the demand line and the supply line were not lines, but they were in fact curves, then we would need calculus to find this area. Anyway, um, this consumer surplus is defined as the region that lies below the demand curve and above the horizontal and to the right, of course, of the p-axis or the vertical axis. The consumer surplus is the measure of, my um, apologies here, this uh, word, uh, statement measure of is written in here twice. So it's the measure of the amount that the consumer would be willing to pay above what they actually paid. All right? And it says find the consumer surplus and write it as a system of inequalities. So here's the, here's the concept. Let's imagine that the price is set here. This is what the supplier has set the price at. They're going to charge the customer this amount. In this case, 120 bucks. All right? They're going to charge you $120 to buy this PDA here. But you would have paid, um, let's say it's uh, Catherine. Catherine would have paid up here for a PDA. She would have paid whatever this price was. And let's say that price is, I don't know, $140. Um, you saved Catherine 20 bucks because you only paid 120. You would have paid this, but you paid 120. You saved 20 bucks. And let's say um, someone else, let's say Luke would have paid 150. He would have been perfectly willing to pay $30 over, but he only paid 120. He saved $30. And let's say Jack paid 125. I'm sorry, he paid 120 but he would have been willing to pay 125. He would have paid that if he wanted to, if, uh, if that was what they charged. But instead, they, they set the price at 120, so he paid 120. And everybody else bought a PDF, or sorry, a PDA here, bought a PDA. They would have been willing to pay a little bit more, but the price was set at 120, and so they saved money. The area of this region represents the collective money saved by all consumers. So if you added up the $10 or I'm uh, sorry, $20 that Catherine saved and the $30 that Luke saved and the $5 that Jack saved and the other monies that any other individual that would have been willing to pay more but only paid 120, you added all that money up, that is equal to the area of this region. That is consumer surplus. All right? Hopefully that makes sense. Um so our job here is to Find the consumer surplus, which means literally calculate the area of that shaded region. All right, find the consumer surplus. And they also want us to write a system of inequalities for that region. All right, so we got to do two things here. Let's start with the system of inequalities. I think that might be slightly easier. All right. Um, if I'm writing a system of inequalities here, then I need the demand curve as my top boundary, right? That's the top. I need this line as my bottom, and then of course it has to be greater than or equal to zero. 
So I've got the top bounded by the demand line. So we already know that function. Oops. We already know that function. That is P has to be less than or equal to the 150 minus 0 0.00001x. That's, again, my demand line bounding the top of this region. I need the line on the bottom here bounding the bottom of the region, which is just this horizontal line at 120. So P is greater than or equal to 120. And then I also need um, really the, uh, the vertical line here on the left side bounding this region. So let's say it is Q for quantity is greater than or equal to zero. All right, and that bounds this region entirely. So there's the system of inequalities. That was a pretty straightforward problem. Now we need the area of that region. And it is just, I keep changing the size of this because I wanted to make sure that we can see it all. The area of this region is just the area of a triangle. All right, so let me write it down here. Consumer surplus equals the area of a triangle. That's all we have. And the area of a triangle is one half base times height. Okay, well, what's the base? Well, the base, we've already figured that out. The base is the distance um, from here to here. It is this line, all right? And we know that that quantity, based on the part, or question number one here, that quantity is 3 million. So the base is 3 million. So our area is 1 half 3 million. From the previous problem, we had 3 million. Whoops. And then we need our height. And we go back and we look at this height. The height is really this distance from here to here, right? Um, this demand line, right, from here to here, this demand line was started here and went down. Well, that, if we go back to the function, is a y-intercept of 150. So this position up here in this corner is 150. So what is the height? The height is the difference between 150 and 120. The height here is 30, all right? So one half of 3 million times was technically, I said 30, but really what it is is it's 150 minus 120, right? That's where that 30 came from. Um, and if you do this, you get 45 million. All together, if they sell 3 million PDAs at $120, then the consumers who would have been willing to pay more collectively saved $45 million. All right? That is consumer surplus. In class, we will discuss what we call producer surplus or supplier surplus. All right? I will talk about that um, together with you in class. Thank you.